panel is a little bit late. Um, in Leipzig, we have media freedom, but we have no cabs. Uh, that's really a problem, and uh, we also have a problem with the traffic. But now we start. Uh, dear guests and audience, um, welcome to this panel about media capture in uh, East Europe. My name is Lutz Kinkel. I'm the managing director of the European Center for Press and Media Freedom, which is located in Leipzig. I will guide you now through the following 60 minutes. I think we have 50 minutes all in all, as I heard already from Vera Jourova's cabinet. Um, first of all, I would like to inform you about the schedule. Uh, my plan is to have a talk of about 40 minutes. Um, afterwards, I'd like to deal with questions from the floor. So if you have questions, you might take notes if you want to, and then submit them later. Uh, secondly, I want to walk through three different aspects uh, of media capture. Um, the first aspect is the dystopian situation that we face after a full-blown media capture. So the first aspect is the power of the narrative. You could also say the power of propaganda. The second aspect is, and now we come to the operational level, uh, how does me uh, media capture actually function? So what kind of instruments do governments use to destroy independent media? The third aspect of our discussion is rather simple. I will ask Commissioner Vera Jourova how we can restore paradise in the EU and how the Commission will do that. So that's, that's the easy part, so to say. Um, what we have on our plate is, again, the power of the narrative. How does uh, media capture take place? and what are the political possibilities of the European Commission to intervene. Um, let me introduce my guests. Oh, the first paper is flying away, but it's already done with the first paper. <laughs> um, I already mentioned her. Vera Jova uh, is Vice President of the European Commission. Uh, her working fields are values, transparency, rule of law, disinformation, and media pluralism. Vera Jova grew up in the Czech Republic. Um, she knows from her own experience what it means to be forced to live uh, in the sceneries of state propaganda. Welcome, Vera Jova. We have with us Peter Tvorak. I hope I, I, hope I pronounce it halfway okay. Um, he's also Czech. He is the Director General of the public TV station CT and Vice President of the European Broadcasting Union. Uh, from what we perceived also at the ECPMF, uh, Peter Dvorak was on the hit list of the former government, um, led by Andrei Babiš. I hope we can, he will tell us a little bit more about his struggle in the past years. Welcome, Peter Dvorak. <clears throat> Piotr Staszynski, uh, we know each other already from, uh, well, a long, long, long interview that I had with him. Uh, this is why I call him Piotr, and he calls me Lutz. Um, uh, he, he, he was strictly forbidding me to, to say the following sentence that I wrote. Um, please allow me to say um, that he's a legend of Polish journalism. But I take my freedom as a journalist and my freedom of expression to say that. <laughs> In the 80s, he was arrested for his journalistic work. Um, accused of committing political crimes in Poland. And since 1993, he's with the Gazeta Wyborcza, uh, the largest liberal daily in Poland. Uh, since 2001, he's deputy editor, uh, editor, editor in chief. So welcome, Piotr Szczesinski. Welcome. I wrote my Nobel Prize speech in case I get one. Okay, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Let me start the discussion uh, with the current situation uh, to get a feeling of what it means if the state uh, is controlling uh, the public sphere. Uh, you all know the Russian narrative, uh, why the invasion of, the U of Ukraine uh, is allegedly legitimate. Um, this narrative is the claim that the country is governed by Nazis. This is obviously not the truth, but the narrative is repeated so often in Russia that obviously also large parts of the population believe in it. 
Um, this is at least one part, one aspect of the explanation why there is no mass resilience and no mass protest against Putin's politics uh, in Russia. Uh, Vice President Jourova, um, did we all underestimate the effects of full-blown state propaganda? Is it possible to literally brainwash people um, so that they believe uh, in, in the state's policies uh, if you control the majority of the media landscape? Yes, good, good evening. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this amazing place. Uh, and I forgot the question. No, don't worry. Uh, we, what we see now in Russia is a stark reminder of the fact that it is possible to brainwash the big mass of people. And especially when you do it over decades, which was happening in Russia, and when you, if, when you try to understand a little bit the, the mentality and the societal setup, uh, according to the experts, uh, for the Russian people, the truth is what the Tsar says. Now it's President Putin. He is the one who sets the truth. And he has the army uh, of so-called media to deliver this message, what he believes is true, to the people. And what we see now in Russia is total darkness. Uh, the people cannot read and, and hear uh, any facts, uh, only the, the uh, pro-Kremlin or Kremlin propaganda. The penalty of 15 years in prison. Of course, it's something which is unprecedented, something which we did not uh, experience in the, in the communist regimes. And I unfortunately remember the regime quite well. So uh, this is possible and uh, it is also based uh, on the slogan, I believe, that this is used, that 100 times repeated lie becomes the truth. And this is something which was also tested on European citizens successfully. Yep. Because since 2014, according to our data, the intensity of Russian propaganda on European territory was uh, increasing. A uh, big part of the narratives were uh, covering Ukraine. So Russia was uh, in a very uh, experienced way preparing the ground in European society, preparing the ground for the future invasion. Uh, they believed that uh, there will be a higher acceptance uh, of, from the side of European people that they are attacking uh, or attacking, that they are defending themselves against the Nazi regime in Ukraine. And it did not materialize, it, it didn't happen, because after the invasion, even after several years of this massage, uh, the uh, surveys showed that the people uh, reacted in the proper way in, in all the member states. The numbers of those who used to believe the Russian narratives dropped uh, radically down. But uh, this is not the end of the story. And now I'm afraid that uh, with uh, increased tension in European Union, in our member states, uh, with increased prices of food, energy, uh, with increased uh, uh, tiredness of the war, which, which we already see in our society, uh, it will be the case that the Russian narratives will again be gaining ground. But uh, it, it sounds pessimistic, but we do a lot of things uh, against that, so maybe in the next question. Mr. Tvorzak, could you please describe this, uh, what, what, um, what Vera Jourova already mentioned, so the, uh, the influx of the Russian propaganda into the Czech society a little bit more concrete and probably with examples. What does that mean for the public sphere in Czech? Hello, everybody. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, we are used to the Russian propaganda since a uh, long time. And if I take uh, like a close, a close past, uh, it started already with the immigration crisis. Then we heard a lot of disinformation during the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. And now we hear a lot of disinformation regarding the war in Ukraine. And it, 
why it's so widely spread? It has, I believe, two reasons. One reason is the technical reason, because uh, with the growth of social media, with the, grow, with the growth of possibilities of single people to share information between each other, much easier than in the past, and with the speed how this information can be spread around, this enables even a, a smaller media or smaller groups on social media to spread this disinformation between, between people. And second uh, reason is the political reason, because uh, the spread of disinformation became also a political agenda of uh, some political groups. And in case of the Czech Republic, there is the extremist party called SPD, and they use very often the disinformation in their political campaign. Uh, be it uh, information about Ukraine currently, be it information about uh, immigrants or about refugees, be it uh, the information about uh, the way how the COVID should be treated. <laughs> and about <laughs> Ms. Yorova as well, yeah, exactly. So those two reasons, I believe, uh, are the main reasons why the disinformation is spread uh, between the society. What happened in Czech Republic uh, when uh, on 24th of February uh, Putin invaded Ukraine? On 25th of, uh, of, uh, of February, eight disinformation websites were suspended uh, from the Czech internet. And uh, that was one of the attempts of the current government to fight back uh, the disinformation wave. Uh, and. I believe this was, this was pretty successful. They didn't prevent them uh, to do it again, but at least, at least they made their life a little bit harder. What can we do as a, a public service institution? I believe that the best way how to fight the disinformation is do our work in the proper way. So to inform the people, give them the people unbalanced and unbiased information. Czech TV, by the way, is the most trusted media in the Czech Republic. Uh, we have a trust of about 60% of the people. If I compare it to the commercial TVs, the two other commercial groups, one is 23%, the second one is 16%. So we are by far uh, the most trusted trusted information source. Uh, and what we have to do is to, to, to occupy, to get the proper information to the people as much as we can. And we can use our own strength, but what we can do is also to use our unity within Europe, within European Broadcasting Union, to share the knowledge, share the information, share the themes. I just give you one example. Czech TV was one of three televisions together with the France TV and to get together with the Ukrainian TV, who did the first official interview with the President Zelensky. And this interview was used by 120 other media organizations who broadcasted it on 20, 260 different channels. So this is something we have to do, we have to inform, and if we inform in a proper way, uh, and if we use all the channels we can, we are not only TV, we are active on internet, we have our social media uh, platforms. So if we do it in a proper way, this is the best way how to fight it. Um, Piotr, um, in, in Poland, it's not only the problem of Russian propaganda that you probably perceive, um, but it's also the, the problem of state propaganda of the peace government. Uh, the peace government is also using the label Nazi for any kind of opponent uh, and characterizing these people as Nazis. Um, why does this label still work so well in Eastern Europe, although um, it's obviously used inflationary? I would say that it doesn't work well. Mm -hmm. It is being used from time to time especially by the pro-peace, pro-law and justice party media. Law and justice, by the way, is the name of this party and it's caricature. No law and no justice. Uh, so uh, what we have in Poland, uh, there is a problem of monopoly in uh, public service broadcasting media. So these are different things uh, and the monopoly 
is the answer. If you have a regional monopoly or social monopoly, in the sense that people who are less educated and have the access only to the uh, government or state-controlled uh, service, uh, public service broadcasting media, you have the narrative that, you, that you're talking about. You have the power of propaganda, which is virtually unlimited. So the, uh, as I see it, you know, the, uh, the monopoly is one of the answers. And in Poland, for, for instance, it's completely different than in your country. And I mean to Peter Dvořák. It's completely different because uh, the uh, public service broadcasting media, the largest in terms of audience, were taken over by the government, by the Peace Party, uh, right at the beginning of when they took power in the late 2015. And everything there is to serve the, govern, the governors. You know, the, <clears throat> you may know the famous saying, and I think that it's the simplest definition of journalism or the, the media mission in general, that the press, the media, have to serve the governed, not the governors. If press and media serve the governors, this is propaganda, it is not journalism. And this is what we have in Poland in public broadcasting media. Vice President, generally speaking, and when we listened to them both, um, would you say we are in an information war? Would you use this term? Yes, indeed, we are in an information war. Obviously, uh, with the start of the war, already before that, uh, we were discussing in the Commission whether we are not too naive to be passive and just to watch the uh, Russian media, which have been established to spread propaganda, because it, is, it was the purpose for uh, establishing Russia to or, or Sputnik, but uh, we should not be tougher uh, against them and whether we should not take uh, strong decisions, and we did it. And uh, uh, we uh, put on, I think it was the third package of the sanctions, uh, uh, the, sanction, the, the, the sanctioning the Russia Today and Sputnik. Uh, two days ago, the states adopted the decision to, to ban some other, uh, uh, three other channels. Also, the member states uh, have the competence uh, to take uh, action against the media which are endangering the national security. The states do not have to wait for the commission or for the union uh, to take decisions or to, to adopt the laws. And obviously we are in the information war and we have to uh, uh, organize things differently because uh, this is not, not normal situation. While in COVID time this information was used as a poison because there was a lot of harmful content which was endangering health and lives of people. Now the disinformation and propaganda is used as a weapon. And I would even say weapons of mass destruction when they use for spreading the, the platforms which can deliver the disinformation uh, to millions of people within, within a set, second. So uh, uh, this is appropriate to say that we are in the information war, but at the same time, we should not be hysterical and uh, by fighting this battle, we must not destroy the, the holy principle of the freedom of speech and access to information. Mr. Dvořák, um, <clears throat> we know that when a populist government is, uh, is governing, that the first attack always goes to public service media because the government has, as the regulator, a certain influence on public service media. Um, you went through this process, and as I said, uh, you were on the hit list of the former government of Andrei Babiš. Could you um, tell us a little bit about this uh, period of time and how you, how you managed to get out of the struggle or survive the struggle? Before, before I start to explain what happened in the last four years, I just explain you how 
the governance of the Czech TV works in the Czech Republic. Uh, the Czech TV is the public service media. It has its own council, uh, which consists of 15 people. Uh, those people are voted by the Czech parliament, by the chamber of, Dep of deputies, and they are proposed to the parliament uh, by some independent organizations uh, who basically take them as their representatives on that council. This looks very obvious. This looks very independent. Uh, the truth is that uh, the political parties uh, already got used to pick up their candidates first, and then they told the candidates to find some organization just as a cover uh, to, f to get them into the elections, and then they elect them on behalf of those, those political parties. And they used to have different, different powers to share the powers according to the powers in the parliament. Uh, this, changed, this has changed uh, uh, after uh, the former prime minister Babiš came to the power. And I believe he was not the main, in quotes, enemy of the, of the public service media. Uh, but he got together in some informal coalition uh, with two political parties, with this extreme SPD and uh, with the communists who were not part of the government, but they backed, uh, they backed uh, the ANO, the political movement. And they had also a backing of the presidential office of our president Zeman. And they, they started to pick up the people uh, who became members of my board, who sometimes, who were very critical uh, to, the, uh, to the Czech TV, who were very critical uh, to the news of the Czech TV, and sometimes who didn't even believe in the principles of the public service media as such. Basically, uh, they, they would love to have the same situation like in Poland. And they managed, they managed to put in place approximately eight out of 15 members of the council who immediately after they were elected, they started to shoot at me. They started to look for different small problems. They misused the complaints of their friends. Uh, they uh, started to complain about our news. They started to, to complain about uh, the, some some journalists, about some reporters, about our investigative teams. And they, they, they tried hard uh, to get rid of me mainly because they felt that if they replace me with somebody who will work in their favor, the first thing he will do or she do uh, is to replace the head of news who will get the task, the new one, to get rid of those critical journalists which were in place. This plan didn't happen just because they didn't have enough votes uh, for a dismissal of the CEO because they needed 10 votes for that, but they tried hard. And uh, they didn't manage to finalize this, this plan until the last elections. And after the last elections, which happened last, uh, last fall, the new, new government, uh, which is in place, they, they at least propose uh, that they will, they will uh, support the public service media in the country and they will look after their independence. They also promise to take care of our financing in the medium terms. So uh, now we are in better situations, but I have to admit last two years that was a nightmare and I have to thank Ms. Jourova because uh, we had a plenty of discussions together and she helped me together with my colleagues from other countries, together uh, with my colleagues from EBU, even from Germany, uh, who basically sent complaints to the Czech government trying to prevent to do it. You mentioned um, the president already, Mr. Zeman. I want to add just the famous anecdote, which is also an infamous anecdote because he gave once a press conference i don't know if you know this picture and there he was uh, sitting and he was carrying a rifle an ak-47 uh, and 
there was in, inscripted uh, four journalists. Um, yeah. So um, this was just a, a, a toy, not a real gun, but uh, a toy. Um, but the message was obviously that journalists should be shot by a Russian rifle. Um, there was something before that, because Mr. Zeman visited Mr. Putin, and when they were leaving from the official place where they gave the interview, uh, Mr. Zeman said to Mr. Putin, the journalist should be... Should be eliminated. Eliminated. There, there are too many of them. And eliminated. Mi and Mr. Putin said, said uh, it's not necessary to eliminate it, just make the number a little bit lower. And then this story came with the Kalashnikov. Yes. Yeah, that's Mr. Zeman. Um, I'm glad you made it with the public service media in Czech. It's over in Poland, as you said. Well, this is already a PR and propaganda machine for yeah, the Yeah, they just didn't for the need Kalashnikovs for right? that. I mean, just they shut them up. Yeah. Um, in Poland, they also the government is intervening into the private market uh, very much. And the Gazeta Wyborcza you work for is famous of being sued and sued and sued and sued and sued. Uh, and they are not sued by private persons, but they are sued, you are sued by ministries, by people from the government, uh, uh, companies that are close to, uh, to the government and so on and so forth. Uh, if I'm rightly informed, uh, you have now something like 70 lawsuits going on against the Gazeta Vibor. Nearly 100, because the number is growing each week. And we have about uh, 94, 95 and growing. But the problem is that uh, in many of them, and I'm talking only about the lawsuits initiated by the political figures, political agencies, the government institutions, like ministries, and the state-controlled companies. So we have the, uh, uh, we, we nearly all of them we can call slaps, uh, because slaps is, you know, it's the strategic lawsuit against public participation. Uh, nearly all of them are slaps, because the, uh, the reason and the objective of those uh, suits, the lawsuits, is to, uh, to shut our, us up. To make to harass us, to make us uh, to tire us in a sense that journalists, editors, and our lawyers, a very small bunch of lawyers who have to fight them all the time. And it, it you know it needs time and effort and money and a lot of uh, a lot of work to defend ourselves. And still we win a lot of lawsuits, but the you know, there is a cost of it. It's cost to it. Uh, and we, we, we only win because in Poland still judiciary is, is, is in 80% independent. And Ms. Jurova knows well how, uh, how are trying, uh, I mean the government is trying to control, intimidate, uh, infringe, judiciary independence in Poland. There is about uh, 10,000 Polish judges. And now 2,000 are loyalists, are loyalists to the government. And it's growing step by step. So when we lose a lawsuit, usually because of the uh, recently nominated judge by the political uh, uh, deal dealings through the political political dealings. So th this is the problem, which is the uh, uh, in relation of media, uh, law, and judiciary, and the government, and the state. Vice President Jurova, we heard now already a lot of examples uh, how governments can intervene into public service media and also into the private market. Uh, there are far more. Um, you know them all. And it's not that uh, the uh, European Commission is not reacting. On the contrary, uh, we have the draft of the anti-slap directive. We have the whistleblower directive. Uh, we have the recommendation for the protection of journalists. Uh, we have the upcoming Media Freedom Act and so on and so forth. Um, 
one of the major issues is how to get this on the ground, how to implement this on national level, how to make sure that uh, the European governments really follow also uh, the, uh, the norms and the advice and the values that we have in Europe. Um, how can we ensure that? We need to have good partners for that. When I say we, I mean uh, us who represent the EU. Uh, good partners are the governments who are on the same page when it comes to the values, like freedom of speech and democracy and the rule of law. Uh, when it is not the case, uh, then we see in the member state, like you spoke about Poland, that the uh, principle which is suddenly, which appears in, in some states is that the winner after the elections takes all. Judiciary, media, academia, and civil society, especially those organizations who protect and, uh, and support the minorities. That's, there is always the same scenario. By the way, we saw similar things in the United States under Trump, yeah? so this is not only European, European matter. So, uh, uh, how to do that? Uh, we, of course, need the governments and the national parliaments to uh, take, uh, to, to adopt, because this is always collective work, adoption of the, of the legislation or, or uh, non-binding rules, uh, which uh, we, we need to, to see implemented on the ground. And it's always a heavy task to uh, push forward the legislation which goes against those uh, limitations uh, which I mentioned. On anti-slap, we are at the beginning of the process. I proposed the legislation and uh, uh, the problem is that the core thing in this anti-slap legislation is that an independent judge takes the case and the first thing he or she does is to, to check whether this is abusive litigation or whether there is some justification for the case. And in the moment or at the situation when we do not have independent judges in the state, and if those who lodge these complaints are the, the persons or entities connected with the state, then you have a problem. And I think, think that, uh, I, I wonder how, for instance, Poland will, uh, will approach or will, will, what position of Poland will be on our anti-slap rules because this, this is about protection of journalists and human rights defenders against the abuse of justice. And, and when you, in Poland, there are those two factors, uh, the attacks against journalists and the problematic uh, judiciary system. So uh, we will see, we will see. Do you think Viktor Orban, um, the, the, the Chancellor of uh, Hungary, is a negative role model for governments seeking control of the media landscape? Definitely he is. Uh, I, I, cannot, I, I will not be diplomatic, yeah? And Viktor Orban is used to that from my side. Uh, I think that Viktor Orban uh, set a different governance structure and, and uh, system in, in uh, 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 Hungary, different from what we would like to see in the member states. Uh, because the state, the, the truly democratic state, is governed by the powers which respect the limitation of their powers. Those who win the elections must not uh, invade into those spheres, which must remain independent. And all the spheres which I named before were already somehow affected uh, by, by the, the leading power, by, by Fidesz party, by Viktor Orban's people. And so, of course, this is not the, the role model uh, for, for the rest of Europe. And I am personally worried about uh, the position of Viktor Orban now in the, during the, Ukraine, uh, the, the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Because, of course, I have full understanding for the leaders who say we cannot effort immediate ban of import of, of oil. Of course, there are difficulties in some countries. 
but to name among the enemies or ad adversaries Volodymyr Zelensky, it shows that he is simply standing on the other side. And so I cannot help it, but this is going too far. On the other hand, we have to recognize Viktor Orban as the winner of the elections. And here comes the question how fair the elections were. Thank you for these very clear and outspoken words. I would like to open now to the questions from the floor. We don't have that much time, but if you have a question or two, um, please come up with it. I don't know, is there any helper that has probably a microphone also to get to you? Anyone having a question? If not, I have 100 questions. Yeah, please. Please say your name and uh, your function if possible. Yes, I will. My name is Jochen Fasco. I'm the head of the State Media Authority of Thuringia. And first, I wanted to ask about the, yeah, the DSA and that it, it's necessary that the DSA is um, uh, very far away from state um, in deep, uh, influence, but this is not so, it's, it's important, but I have another question, because uh, Mr. Jurova, you said we are in, a, in an information war. And what can we do, what would you suggest to do, one, two, three things, to, to weapon our citizens, to weapon the, the kids, but the parents and the grandparents, mostly the, the older ones maybe, they have to understand what happens with them, how are they influenced, and uh, what would you suggest to do uh, f from the EU to, to improve the media literacy? Yes, uh, we always speak about it and we are not doing enough. <laughs> because when I describe what we do against this information, these are all uh, very short term measures, something which is being done now. And we, I always add, and we need to do more to make our society more resilient against the impact of disinformation. So uh, here comes especially the, the, the need to be much better in education and in preparing the, the young generation. Uh, I think that uh, our member states, most of them are already investing in, in lit media literacy and digital literacy. Uh, uh, with the older generation, to be honest, I don't have a good, good answer. And it's, it's a pity because this is, I, I, I think, a very serious societal problem because many uh, seniors are living in high level of uncertainty. The people fear what, about what's happening now, what will happen. And that's why they are so, and they, they most, many of them live alone and they do not have anyone to, to speak about their fears. That's why they are so uh, such easy targets for, for the dis disinformers, and uh, that's why they also uh, then express their fears in how they elect, how they vote. So what, what's the advice? I think that we, we should not underestimate uh, this, these societal aspects. Uh, but I, I, I think we have to embed this uh, building resilience of the society among one of our priorities uh, because uh, this is essential. When we, when we look at how this information uh, uh, system works, uh, we are looking at the producers, at the channels and at the targets. The producers are more or less now clear in the war. Uh, they are quite well identifiable. Of course, not all the proxies of Kremlin which spread disinformation in our member states are easy to identify. As for the channels, we work a lot with uh, the digital platforms, which are the main highways for spread, mass, massive spreading. And we have some agreements with them, with the, with the big platforms. And in mid-June, I will present the code, new code of practice against the disinformation which is also involving advertising industry, uh, so that not to feed the, uh, the, the, the disinformation systems and channels. 
and uh, we uh, have now a special agreement with uh, the digital platforms uh, that they have to do more against Russian propaganda, no mercy, if they, when they see a manifestly clear lies, something like Ukrainians are Nazis, it has to be removed. And uh, what we expect from them to do this job in all 24 languages of EU member states, because what we see is, is that they are, they are neglecting, especially the east of Europe. And I, I'm pushing hard. Uh, this is the first situation, and it is connected with your question whether we are in the information war. That's the first situation when I am telling the platforms, choose the side where you stand. Don't be neutral. You have to proactively help us to help Ukraine to win the war. So these are the channels. I don't want to speak too long, but uh, we are sometimes forgetting about the targets the people who uh, uh, are easy, easy uh, victims. Uh, easy victims are the people who create the crowd, not so much individual people. But I think that the digital uh, companies, the digital platforms especially, they did their best to create the crowd, which is easy to manipulate, which is easy to sell the goods to, and so uh, it's, co it's also connected with the business model, but I will stop here. Another question, I will take one question from the floor, the man sitting there with the blue shirt, please. Uh, my name is Andreas Hermann. I'm the head of an of a independent radio station in the border triangle between Poland, Germany and Czech. I think it's quite funny because Peter Tworzak mentioned some difficulties with the Babish government in coalition with the SPD and the communists. But uh, Commissioner Jourova, you are also from the, from the ANO party. <laughs> uh, uh, has it improved the relationship to, to Peter Dvorak? Have you overcome the difficulties from the, part, from the past? How, how is it today? <laughs> yeah. I don't know the Commissioner, it's a, a strange kind of animal. Uh, because when you join the Commission, you are not forced by the rules to leave the party, but you have to stop the activities. You have, you have simply to, to stop any, any kind of camp or campaigning or helping your own, own party. So it requires uh, total passivity or neutrality, which I respect and I obey. Uh, this is not washing hands, this is <laughs> just a description of how we have to behave in, in, this, in this position. So I didn't leave the party, I uh, was thinking about it twice, that I will have to, because it was uh, morally impossible to continue, in my view. And it was always after the elections, when there were some strange talks between the ANO party and the SPD, which Petr Dvořák mentioned, uh, some ideas that SPD could be invited to create the, the governing coalition. For me, this was the red line. And it was the moment when I would have to uh, jump out of my uh, perfect neutrality and, and leave the party. But it didn't happen. So uh, in two and a half year time, I will come back and I will say to my party, I am back and either I will be able to continue or the situation will change so radically that I will have to leave. But uh, now I live in my kind of splendid uh, isolation or neutrality. The splendid isolation. Um, okay, I would like to, uh, to make a last question uh, and I would like you also to answer briefly. Sorry? Um, I said only two questions, so we have, to, we have to come to the end, unfortunately. Um, my last question would be... Is that true? He cannot fall asleep tonight? Okay, then please ask your question. <laughs> um, I'm a student, and uh, next to the uh, influence by governments in media, we also have a, a massive impact of oligarchs in um, 
Central Eastern Europe, so how to deal with that and to create a free journalism uh, next to government's influence and to the impact of oligarchs. So there are different ways, but uh, I believe that there are two main ways how to keep uh, the public media independent. There is the political way. It means to create such a legal environment which prevents to take over uh, the governing bodies of the public service media and to enable uh, to enable to vote into those controlling bodies, those people who may not agree with the management all the time, but who defend the values of the public service media. So that's the first thing. And second way how to make the public service media independent is to care for the proper financing. Because if they are properly financed, if they are financed in a way that they deliver the public value which the, which the public expects and if the financing is not controlled and decided by the politicians all the time and it's only on their decision if they allow to, to do the public service in such a quality and in such a, uh, in, in such a, such a spread uh, the people are used to and they, they, the people like then those two principles is just enough. And I have to say I am in a position right now that for the first part, the current coalition, they try to define those principles uh, to change the way how the members of the Council of the Czech TV are voted because they would like to invite also the members of the Senate, so the whole parliament, not only the, the ch Chamber of Deputies, but also the Senate will have a chance to vote for those members, which will, uh, which will enable uh, for those people to be more independent. And just now I'm trying to push also to care for the second part, to build a principles of the future financing of, of my institutions. There I'm not quite as successful until now, but I can understand the reasons we are in the war. One sentence, we are now preparing the Media Freedom Act, which should help to decrease the political and economic pressures on media. So we will see whether we will manage in July. Thank you. We take you by the word, um, Commissioner Jovova, and thank you for this optimistic note at the end of the panel. Thank you for your attention, and have a good evening. Thank you.